Alicia, the Supreme Court handing down a slew of major decisions this week, as Alexandria just covered. Now for a closer look of what these cases mean, joining us is Jonathan Adler, a law professor at Case Western Reserve University. Jonathan, thank you. Let's go right into it, but we've got on our board for us so you can see this is that 6-3 split court. We can put here the uh, liberal judges, Ketanji Brown-Jackson, Elena Kagan, and Sonia Sotomayor, and of course the 6 Conservative justices led by Chief Justice John Roberts, and it was in the three cases, as uh, Alexandria laid out, in the student loan forgiveness case, the LGBTQ case out of Colorado, and the affirmative action case, that this court ruled that way. Before I get into the details of the court itself, we're already seeing headlines, Jonathan, that this conservative court, the, the Roberts court, is remaking American society in its conservative view of the world. What do you say to that? Well, I think those claims just simply aren't true. If you look at the behavior of the Supreme Court uh, since World War II, the Roberts Court overturns prior precedents, modifies prior precedents, and strikes down legislative enactments less often than the Warren Court did, less often than the Burger Court did, less often than the Rehnquist Court did. Uh, so just in terms of looking at how often the court is changing the law in that sort of way or rejecting what legislatures do, this court is far less active in changing the law than its predecessors were. Now let's go to the most recent one. Of course, that is a student loan debt. The court essentially ruling, saying that no, the executive branch does not have Congress's power of the purse. And you can see some of the history we have here on the screen. What, what do you make of this ruling? Well, this ruling is one of a series of rulings where the court has emphasized that the executive branch has the power that Congress enacts and gives to the executive branch. Uh, the president doesn't just get to create a student loan program or a student loan forgiveness program on his own. Uh, rather, the executive branch and the Department of Education executes the laws that Congress enacts. And just like we saw in, in a big environmental case last term, uh, the court is reminding both Congress and the president that Congress enacts these sorts of laws, the president then gets to implement them. And it's one thing to make slight modifications about what sorts of forms uh, you submit or when they're due. It's quite another to literally remake the entire program uh, in order to uh, create $400 billion worth of debt relief. Hey, Jonathan, we saw President Biden yesterday saying that he believes the court misinterpreted the Constitution on this case, uh, and they're going for Plan B. We don't know what Plan B is going to look like, but uh, do you believe that possibly if they attempt another version of what they did here, perhaps in a more narrow scope, that that will be challenged in courts as well? Well, it, it really depends on how they do it. If you recall when um, the... Department of Education had uh, delayed when payments were due and had, had paused the accumulation of interest. Those weren't ch weren't challenged. Uh, a more narrowly targeted plan that uses clearer authority that Congress has enacted might well withstand any challenge. Um, as the president has also acknowledged, doing alternative routes requires going through a greater administrative process than we saw here. And that creates the opportunity both for people to raise concerns about the plan, as well as for the government to make sure that what they're doing is legal. It's actually a more regular use of executive power than, than what we saw with this plan. Let's go to that case of the web designer in Colorado. 6-3 was the decision in that case. And uh, Sonia Sotomayor, I believe, was a dissent on that, saying essentially that this ruling now gives businesses license to discriminate uh, against LGBTQ folks. What is your reaction to this ruling? Yeah, I really think that's a misreading of this case. I mean, in this case involved a web designer, someone who's creating web content, something we all recognize is expressive activity, is the sort of activity that, that's covered by the First Amendment, just like a television broadcast or a radio show or a newspaper or a blog. And what the court said is that the government can't compel somebody engaged in that sort of activity to communicate or, an exp or express a point of view or, or a perspective that they don't agree with. So even this particular web designer, she can't discriminate against who hires her. If When someone contacts her to create a website, she can't say, no, I don't like you, or I don't like some characteristic about you, so I will not work for you. She's merely been given the right to say, I'm not going to create a message, create a form of expression right. that violates my beliefs. That's a core First Amendment protection against compelled speech. 
Uh, and I think that's really all the court did in this case. Let's go to the affirmative action case, clearly one of the most consequential of the Roberts court so far. Your thoughts? Uh, it's, a, it's a very big case, a very big decision. Uh, what the, the court essentially did here is say that the way universities like Harvard and the University of North Carolina and like a, a lot of universities, are the way they are using race uh, goes too far. It relies upon stereotypes. It has negative consequences for many applicants, in particular uh, Asian applicants. Uh, and the court said that that's just not compatible with prior precedent on either the, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment or Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, uh, and that it's one thing to look at applicants as individuals and look at their experiences and their background and uh, see if that's something you want at your university, but to make broad generalizations about applicants based on their race is, it, the court held, is not consistent with prior precedent uh, and not consistent with federal statutes or the Constitution. And just in the last case I want to touch on before we run out of time, you can see the court was 9-0 on that postal worker who simply believed it was against his religious beliefs to force him to work on Sundays. 9-0, did they get it right? I think they did. I mean, this case, there, there was some language in a prior court decision that had suggested that anything more than de minimis that an employer has to do is an excuse not to accommodate an, an employee's religious practices and religious faith. And the court basically said that, looked in context and look at what the law says, lower courts had overinterpreted that language, that um, employers can be expected to take reasonable steps to accommodate the religious beliefs of their employees. In this case, it was an employee uh, that didn't want to work on Sunday, but this will apply to people of all religious faiths. And it, it basically restores the, the underlying principle that employers can be expected to take reasonable steps, but if it's a really costly accommodation, well, then um, the employer doesn't have to do that. Professor Jonathan Adler, great insight as always. Professor, thanks for taking time. Have a great weekend. My pleasure. You too. I'm Steve Ducey. I'm Brian Kilme. And I'm Ainsley Earhart. And click here to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page to catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis.